Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to our session today. Um, this session is called The Importance of Identity Work and Implementing Culturally Responsive and Sustaining Practices within PBIS. Uh, please make sure uh, to record uh, the code that you see. We're going to leave that there for just a moment uh, so that you can have it. And then at the end of the session, we'll have a unique code that we'll share that you'll be able to use. Uh, the materials for today's presentation can be accessed by clicking on the presentation materials tab below. Uh, you also can download those materials if, it's, if you're having difficulty seeing any of the content on the screen. Uh, today, I actually have the privilege, again, I feel like I've uh, just won some special prize to be in this space, uh, to introduce two of my dear colleagues and friends who are also educational leaders, Mylene uh, Leverson and Kent Smith. I want to tell you a little bit about them for those of you who may not have been in the first session that they, they led. Uh, Melania and Ken are educational consultants for uh, systems equity at Cooperative Educational Service Agency 10, which is in Wisconsin. Prior to their current roles in this agency, they both worked as TA providers and leaders at the Wisconsin RTI Center and the Wisconsin PBIS Network. Uh, Melania Kent's work involves focusing on helping schools and districts and other organizations build or revise their systems to address equity by mapping onto existing practices such as positive behavior supports and multi-tiered systems of support. Mylene and Ken are also the co-authors of the PBIS Cultural uh, Responsiveness Field Guide, Resources for Trainers and Coaches. Some of you may have been using that, and if you haven't, they're going to uh, share some of those with you uh, as we talk today. This field guide that they are co-authors on outlines an integrated framework to embed equity efforts into school-wide positive behavior in, uh, interventions and support by aligning culturally responsive practices to co core components of positive PBIS at the school-wide level. I actually met Kent and Mulaney seven years ago at the National PBIS Leadership Forum. I was really impressed with their passion, again, with their knowledge, and the way that they uncom uh, uncompromisingly talk about centering equity practices and culturally responsive practices um, uh, with PBIS. And we had learned after we interacted for some time that we had very similar interests and had stake in this work. And we just, we've just we been collaborating ever since. Um, Ken and Melania are also a part of the National PBIS TA Center's Equity Work Group. Uh, and they're gonna talk more about that probably as they move forward today. And that's been the place where we really had the opportunity to get to know each other, to hang out, uh, to be thought partners to each other, critical friends to each other, and we continue to collaborate. Thank you, Kent and Mulaney, for being here today. I feel like we're in for another treat. Those of you who were in the previous session, we're just going to keep going deeper. And for those of you who are just joining us, don't worry, we got you, and it's going to be a great session. Handing it off to you. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ruthie. Let me get to the right screen. So good morning. This is Identity Work and Culturally Responsive Practices. And I'll just show you our contact information really quick. I'm Melanie Leverson. I'm coming to you from an organization in Western Wisconsin called CESA 10, which um, Ruthie referenced already. But myself and my co-presenter Kent were recently hired there to develop a new service for schools, districts, and community organizations to focus on equity in systems. So if you heard in the first session, what we're hoping to do is move even deeper into the equity work that we know PBIS needs in order for it to be reflective of and responsive to all students in our buildings. So you can see our contact information here on this slide. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, we're always more than happy to hear from people and take any criticism, any anything that you'd like to share with us, we're happy to talk with you about. So today, before we jump into the introductions and those pieces, I just wanted to do a brief agenda. We're going to cover a few topics. We're going to start by discussing school and community identity, move into student and family identity, and finally end with practitioner identity and the impact of implicit bias on educators and on systems. Before we do that, we want to make sure that we acknowledge the past, present, and future stewards of the occupied lands that we are on as we attend this virtual conference. I'm presenting to you from Western Wisconsin, about 30 miles north of Eau Claire, which is where Kent is joining us from. We both reside on land that has a long history as a home for Native people and is also where the Treaty of 1838 identified specific boundaries for those peoples using the rivers here as a landmark. I'm coming to you specifically from the occupied land of the Anishinaabe and Ocheti Sequoyan people, and Kent is coming to you from the lands of the Ocheti Sequoyan, Anishinaabe, and Menominee. We gratefully lift up 
their stewardship of this land for future generations and acknowledge and appreciate their contributions to all areas of society, medicine, education, the environment, science, and the communities that they're a part of. And since we cannot see any members, or we cannot see everyone in this session, if there are any members of these nations or any First Nations people in the session, we wanna welcome you. And for all attendees, if you've not learned the history of the land that you reside on, please do so using the link on the slide to just further your learning. So as we move into identity development, it looks like I deleted the slide that allowed Kent to introduce himself. So I'm going to skip back and let him do that really quick and then we'll keep moving forward. So good morning. Uh, for those of you that were not in our first session, my name is Kent Smith. I am a social worker and a school social worker by training um, and have worked with Mulaney not only in our current role, but um, sort of the previous organization that we worked for and the district that we worked together in in Eau Claire um, long before the um, Wisconsin RTI Center started. Um, my background is, like I said, social work. I started out as a child abuse investigator and an in-home family therapist and moved into the schools. And I appreciate uh, you being here and I appreciate the space and your interest in the topic. Thanks, Kent. And for just a little bit about my background, I'm trained as a school psychologist and a special education director. I grew up in a very small town in Wisconsin. And um, and as Kent said, kind of came to this work through some issues that we had in our district where we were identified as disproportionate and PBIS was seen as one of the solutions. What we realized as we started implementing is that PBIS alone, if you don't ensure that it's responsive to your students and reflective of your students and families and communities, isn't going to make the difference. It's not going to change those disproportionate outcomes. So that's how we began in this work. And we've just continued working through it and meeting amazing people like Ruthie and her colleague, Beth Hill. And we're just very happy to be here today. So one important thing to note about the work of identity development is that it cannot be done in isolation. If you saw us this morning, you've already heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again. It's not enough for one teacher in one classroom to investigate their own identity in isolation. We have to make space in our systems for all staff to do this work. Additionally, taking some words from your keynote speaker yesterday, Dr. Muhammad, we have to be sure that when we ask staff to do something in our buildings, we balance accountability. So whether or not they did it, holding them accountable with support. Meaning that not only do we need to hold all of our staff accountable for doing the identity work, but that we as leadership teams must ensure that all staff have the necessary support to do the work. Meaning the resources, the time, the materials, potentially coaching. If our system doesn't provide the necessary support, it's not reasonable for us to expect that all staff are going to meet that expectation of doing this work and doing it well. So again, just wanna reiterate this must be systemic and it must not be a one and done. And I know this slide is very difficult for you to read, especially the way the screen is right now. So don't worry if you can't see the specific statements. I just wanted to bring you one example of identity work that was systemic in nature. So in this particular organization, as sort of a kickoff to this identity work, all staff were asked what they bring to the work of the organization and to culturally responsive practices in general. By carving time out of a staff meeting, so we took the time specifically to just dedicate to this conversation, have people brainstorm what they bring to the table, what is their specific gift in this arena. And many people felt that they didn't have a gift and then were coached through thinking about what gifts they do have that can lead to really strong, influential, culturally responsive practices. So by taking that time, by doing that coaching, our staff were then given the resources necessary to consider their gifts in relation to the bigger systems work that we were moving into. The answers that people came up with were compiled into this Wordle, and then we referred back to this in future meetings. So always coming back to that baseline conversation of what you as an individual 
bring to this work? And sometimes that was just a willingness to move or just encouragement. I bring encouragement for other people. Sometimes it was a specific tangible content knowledge that we needed in order to move the work forward. But again, by identifying those pieces, by making space to have this conversation, we started to build the groundwork, lay the groundwork for the systemic nature of this work and the collective nature of this work. So I said the first thing we were going to discuss is that school and community identity. Systems have to build in ways for staff to examine and learn about the overall identity of the school and of the community as a whole. So this involves getting to know who's in the community, what cultural groups they might ascribe to, what community members value, and what their expectations are of the school system. It's also really critical for school teams and staff to learn about any shared history between various community groups and the school or district. In our previous session, Kent talked about the boarding schools that many Native American populations were sent to. If that happened in your area and you're unaware of it or your school system is unaware of it and not acknowledging it, that's a huge disconnect that could happen, a huge potential for disconnect between your school and those specific populations. So what we're looking for here is things like whether or not the school is a source of pride for the community or whether community members feel valued, feel heard, feel seen by the school system. These bits of knowledge and awareness can really help our school staff and our leadership teams build systems that reflect their students, reflect their families, and support the communities served by the school. Tobin and Vincent developed this model to describe how a student's cultural identity can interact with a school's cultural identity to either cause stress to the student or ensure responsiveness to the system. And this school's cultural identity is a piece that Kent is going to get into a little bit later today when he talks about practitioner identity. That's really where this comes from. The school's cultural identity is like a compilation of all of the people that are in the school building, supporting, sustaining the system. That cultural identity is very specific and can seem um, pretty steady from school to school, despite the fact that our schools are serving very different communities across the geographic areas. So the student's cultural identity might include things that you see on the screen like gender, individual language, or tradition. What you're looking at here in this graphic is that if the school's institutional language or rules or expectations differ from the students, that will likely cause this cultural stress that you see up here. By learning about the students, families, values, community identities, we can work to ensure that these systemic pieces are reflective of and responsive to students' identities. And that will help us ensure cultural responsiveness. If we can get to this place and remove this cultural stress, we're going to make it in incredibly easier for students to move into what they need to do intellectually for learning and move out of the stress of just being somewhere where they feel like they don't fit. The only people who belong in our school buildings are the students. That's the beauty of public education. That's what we're here for. And until we acknowledge that and recognize that as adults, we'll never have systems that truly reflect our students. So for those of you who might be a little bit of a data nerd like me, a school psychologist over here, I wanted to be sure to include some evidence of how critical this identity work truly is. So not only is it critical for staff to understand their own and their students' identities, it's also a really promising practice to encourage students to build an awareness of their own cultural background if they haven't already. We don't want to assume that they haven't. But as you can see here in um, a couple of studies, with an increased awareness of their own cultural background and development of self-worth, specifically fourth grade African-American students demonstrated a decrease in problem behavior. And academic and behavioral outcomes during middle school increased. So should you encounter anybody who needs evidence before they'll embark on this work, feel free to share, share the sources that are cited on this slide. <laughs> 
Before we move deeper into the content, I want to take a moment to discuss the labels that you'll hear us use throughout this presentation. And actually, I thought about this in the previous presentation <laughs> that we really should have included this yeah. in both. But when we're discussing national or state data, we are going to default to the race and ethnicity categories as defined by the Office of Management and Budget back in 1997. Those are the categories that our schools and districts report on to the state and that our state reports on to the federal government. So we're falling back on those because that's sort of the standard. We know that that may not be the best language to use, but we wanted to call attention to that. Additionally, um, we bring this to your attention to think about the fact that there are many ways to refer to different groups of people. And while these categories may not be perfect, they do allow for some standardization, especially when it comes to collecting and examining data. The second reason we bring this up is because, because we want to explicitly state that these categories do not fully define students, families, or community members. And we strongly encourage you in your schools or districts to learn more about the groups you see represented in your organizations so that you can truly understand who your students and families are beyond a box that's checked for the federal government. So know that we're aware this language isn't perfect. What we hope that you'll be able to do in your own settings is find the language that feels good to your communities, your families, and your students, and use that language knowing that this is how things are reported and this is how data is generally analyzed. We have a question. From Anna, she's asking, are you able to share the full references from the previous slide? Oh, well, that's a great question. I will work on that when I switch over to Kent's presentation or Kent's part of the presentation. Thank you. So where many efforts to embed culturally responsive practices or to center equity seem to fall short is when they fail to address the factor of practitioner identity. Until practitioners like me understand our own identity, our values, our backgrounds, and why we are who we are today, it's going to be very difficult for us to establish meaningful connections with students and families. And what tends to happen, especially I said I'm coming to you from Wisconsin, is that our educators tend to look like me. They tend to be white and female. 75-ish percent of our educators are white females here in Wisconsin. So what that means is, we sort of take for granted that many people in the education system have had experiences possibly similar to mine. If we're taking that for granted, if we're not talking about it, if we're not thinking about where those values and where our, our decision-making comes from, then we're going to be implicitly putting all of our identity into the system and ensuring that the system works really well for people who look like me specifically. Um, as you can see here on this slide, understanding your own culture is really a prerequisite to understanding the culture of others. It's like that first language that you learn and then mapping other languages on top of it is easier. But in order to recognize and value and validate other cultures, we really have to first understand our own personal culture and then any potential intersections between the two. As I mentioned, practitioners have to examine and understand how and why they perceive the world the way that they do. We have to take a critical look at our own comfort level with issues of race, with ethnicity, and with disparities that are prevalent across education, across the nation, across Wisconsin, across Michigan. We have to understand the background from which we're developing and applying things like expectations and rules and procedures. How are we defining appropriate behavior. And finally, I want to remind you again that this work must be systemic. It's not enough for one practitioner to examine their own identity in isolation. Our leadership teams, our administration must be actively working to make room for this work and then also supporting staff in devoting time and energy to this self-examination. A critical piece of this self-examination is considering how and why we as adults decide what is appropriate, what is normal, or what is acceptable. As I've mentioned, these definitions can vary greatly from person to person. That variability 
can lead directly to disproportionality. That variability makes room for our system to respond differently to some kids versus others. And that's where we need to target our attention. When we talk about the role of identity in school outcomes and in school discipline, there's some longstanding research that continues to be relevant. When we think about discipline trends, students of color generally are getting referrals for and more significant consequences for subjective behaviors. In other words, behavior infractions are really in the eye of the beholder. So the people giving the infractions, the people assigning those behavioral referrals are the ones we need to target with culturally responsive practices. Not saying that all teachers are racist. We're not trying to say that all teachers are broken. What we're trying to say is we have to focus on the system, not focus on providing an intervention for all of these students that are getting all of these referrals. This is a systemic issue, which is evident by the fact that these data patterns continue to play out time and time again across states, across the nation, we can predict who's going to be successful, which means our systems are set up to ensure that those students are successful and that others are not. So I'm going to hand this off to Kent and go grab those resources for you. Thanks, Mulaney. And I'm assuming people can see my screen? Yes, you're good. Okay. Uh, one more thing. Hold on just a second. Okay. So <clears throat> that identity piece that Mulaney was talking about, our own individual identity, the collective school identity, sort of leads us to this path thinking about, okay, so what is it about that subjectivity? How do we get to that point where subjectivity plays a role? in not only discipline, but really any time in our systems where subjectiveness lives. So our default views or reactions to a particular behavior are guided by this thing that we all have called implicit bias. So you may have heard the phrase implicit bias thrown around a lot over the last couple of years. It's not new, um, but usually what ends up happening is when the topic of implicit bias comes up, Usually it's not within a context or not within a context where it's understood or well described. So the first thing that we want to do is unpack really what implicit bias means so we're not hearing it on the news or catching it, you know, um, on social media. Implicit biases are things that we all have that are unconscious and automatic. And they're the judgments that we make in a given situation that are based on our own limited experiences, the stereotypes that are formed from our birth, the things that we're taught, the examples that we see all of the time. They're reinforced by the media that we consume and the experiences that we have as we grow up. Interestingly, and this is worth noting, implicit biases are generally not an indication of our beliefs or our values but rather kind of our unconscious first sort of the world when we're faced with, with stimulus, environmental stimulus. They're also more likely to come into play when we need to make a snap decision or when we need to act on something that is vague or ambiguous. So as an example of this, I'll use myself. Um, a year or so ago, I was in the car driving somewhere and was listening to public radio and they were talking about a uh, shortage of nurses, especially in our community. In our community, we've got three hospitals, we've got a number of medical clinics, we've got a university and a tech college. But in our community, there's been a shortage of nursing instructors, which meant a back backlog of people trying to get in the program and a nursing shortage here, but it was also national. So when the interviews are, as they're doing the setup, um, the radio host talked about the fact that after the commercial, they were going to be interviewing a nurse to talk about it. I'm like, this is cool. I'm really interested to hear what the nurse has to say. And when the interview started, I was, I found myself being surprised that the nurse was a man. Now, this is worth pointing out, right? Intellectually, 
cognitively, if you ask me whether a nurse could be a man, my answer would be, of course. But I still found myself being shocked that, oh, they got a guy a nurse on the radio. This is interesting, right? That's an implicit bias. My reaction of like, oh, of being surprised doesn't match the things that I would tell you, right? So I started thinking about it. And why was it that I see or why was it that I had that reaction, right? Growing up, the community that I grew up with, the community that I moved to as a child, the clinic that I went to only had women nurses, except one time when I had a surgery and I had a male nurse for one shift, right? When I moved into schools, the nurses that I worked with, the public health nurses, the school nurses were all women. Media typically shows nurses as women, right? So while clearly anyone that wants to be a nurse can be a nurse, my assumption, my, my sort of unconscious assumption at the beginning of the interview was nurse equals female, right? That's an implicit bias. Implicit biases predict the extent to which police officers use force when arresting African-American children as opposed to white children. We're going to talk more about the Goff study in just a minute that arbitrators decide labor grievances in favor of men more often than women. The pediatricians recommend less pain medication for African-American children than white children with identical symptoms. Let me go back to that. Everybody has implicit bias. It's not a matter that implicit bias exists but where we get into problems with implicit bias is how we act based on them when they surface, right? If we pay attention to them, and we're gonna talk about this a little later, if we're aware of them and we lean into them and we recognize them, we can move differently. If we ignore them, we don't look for them, then that's what perpetuates the behaviors that we see, right? Those statistics that you see on the screen. More examples. Attractiveness. Studies show real estate agents rated as being more attractive sell homes for a significantly higher price. And this is a nationwide trend. For height, one inch of height is worth about $789 per year in salary based on that 2004 study. Now, it's my chance for kind of a bad joke. Those of you that have maybe seen me in person, I'm tall, I'm six feet four. And that height thing was kind of speaking to me, right? It's like, oh, wait a minute. That means, wait a minute, why is my salary not that high? And then that attractiveness thing kicked in, so I kind of realized, but sorry, bad joke. But regardless, implicit bias is at play in all sorts of places in all areas of our life. So what does implicit bias have to do with education? And what does it have to do with discipline? And what does it have to do with disproportionality? This quote kind of speaks volumes. It comes from the New York Times op-ed post in 2014, titled, Is Everyone a Little Bit Racist? When we don't stop to think about what's guiding our decisions, when we let our implicit biases just run unchecked, that's where we start getting into problems, right? It's not that we're intentionally doing things, it's that we're unintentionally doing things. We're not managing dynamics of difference. We're just sort of assuming that our frame of reference is the same for everybody, right? And that status quo rules. There's also a great example of this um, that we're not going to show you, but the YouTube link is right there on the slide. And it's a hidden video thing um, where you got people in a park that are being subjected to a scenario, a scene, and they're being asked to share their thoughts and why they acted certain ways, right? Anybody that was in the video made some sort of reference to believing certain ways, right? Believing in equality, believing everybody's equal, but clearly how they responded to similar scenarios based on the people involved differed. It's a relatively short video. It's kind of powerful if you want to use it, but it is what sort of illustrates very nicely implicit bias if you're looking for a resource. Another example is from the misperception of aggression study. In this study, participants were asked to rate sort of the moods of computer-generated images like these. 
they were asked to rate how happy or how angry somebody was. I'll give you a second to look at those. What the study showed was that the images of the African-American person, black person, were consistently viewed as being more severe or more angry than the white faces. What's interesting is that the images are exactly the same computer generated with the exception of the hair and the skin tone. The eyes, the mouth, the nonverbal communication contained is exactly identical. So what this showed was that higher implicit bias perceived with black faces as being more angry in this study. So the Goff study that I mentioned a minute ago kind of took a look at that and, and went deeper into it. In the Essence of Innocence study, Phil Goff looked at, and I'll explain in some subsequent slides, who was involved with the different studies, but the trend that was showing up was that African-American boys as young as 10 were in the studies being more likely to be mistaken as being older. So the age attribution was about four and a half years older than their chronological age, just based on their appearance, and were less likely to be perceived as being innocent in a given scenario compared to their white peers and were viewed as more culpable than their white peers of the same age. He took a deeper look in this with um, some police interviews. And in studying, in doing the study of the 176 officers involved, most of them were males. They were tested on two types of bias. One was a prejudice questionnaire. So they responded to prompts like, it's more likely that black people will bring violence to the neighborhood when they move in. They were also tested on this concept of dehumanization. So given stimuli, they were asked to respond to that stimuli in a certain way, right? And that dehumanization or that response is what measured sort of that unconscious bias. The prejudice questionnaire measured bias. The dehumanization measured that unconscious or implicit. And what was kind of interesting or revealing in the study was that when reviewing the officer conducts records, the officers who showed that implicit dehumanization or that, that unconscious dehumanization were more likely to have used force against black children in custody, right? That's where implicit bias comes into play. Not what we say and what we believe, but what we do when we're not aware of it. He also studied responses based, well, responses of college students. So in his sample, 264, mostly white, mostly female undergraduate students going into education. And this is where that age attribution thing came into play. So when asked to kind of consider the whole age range from infant to 25, the majority of subjects in the study viewed up until age nine children as being equally innocent, regardless of race. However, beginning at about age 10, you started seeing statistical significance in terms of sort of that loss of innocence or that less innocence solely based on appearance. They were also shown photographs along descriptions of behavior infractions or crime and asked to assess that and the culpability. And you see the patterns play out, right? The dehumanization and the prejudice tests used showed similar results to the police officers that were interviewed. So the big takeaway for this is not that we get into these positions that we're in in terms of our unequal outcome or disproportionality, not based on what we say and what we think and, and the things that we're aware of. It's based on those things that we are unaware of. It's based on those things that are implicit, those things that are spontaneous, or the things that are called automatic associations. Implicit biases are part of how our brains work. It's how we're wired to look for patterns. When we're forced to make a quick decision, 
we rely on that, our automatic associations take control. And implicit stereotypes are automatic associations that we have that are outside of it. So when we talk about those, those automatic associations and we talk about how our brains are wired, think about it going back four or 5,000 years. You're going out, you're hunting, you're gathering, you're used to patterns, it's dusk, the night's falling, and you see something that looks like a shrub or a bush, right? And all of a sudden that bush moves. We can't see what it is, so we have to make this quick assumption that pattern is different than what I'm used to, I need to respond. Do I flee? Do I freeze? Do I put up a fight? That's where this comes from, right? And that's how our brains are wired. We all have it. It's how we respond that we want to talk about. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Melanie. And there was a great question in the chat from Jennifer. She asked if teaching programs are doing this identity work with education students. She's a mental health practitioner, so not an educator. You need to still click stop share. Okay, yeah, there, there we go. Um, and I would say I answered in the chat, but largely what we see in Wisconsin is that no, that does not seem to be happening to my knowledge. Um, I think it would be great if it were. Another pattern that we've seen over time in Wisconsin, and I can't speak to this, I mean, I don't know specifics, but we have also seen that many of our teacher prep programs here are not doing this work. They're not even doing the work of like teaching classroom management necessarily, or how to deal with behaviors. So that's been an issue that we've encountered here. Maybe Ruthie can speak to whether or not that's the same in Michigan. I would say that it's it's pretty similar here in Michigan. Programmatically, that's not happening. Depending on what you're studying, uh, that you may be exposed to some uh, experiences, but it would not be something you would see every student going through the education process uh, program, the teacher education program experience. Got it. Thank you. And for those of you that are making comments in here, uh, we will be talking about the Harvard IAT in just a little bit. So thank you for the foreshadowing. And Cassie says they are doing social identity work in their district. Yes. Yay. Right. OK, we're going to keep moving. Sorry, distracted by all the fun things in the chat. So thinking about how we address the issue of implicit bias in our schools, to me, sometimes feels very overwhelming. And I'm in this work day in and day out. So if you feel overwhelmed at this point, if you feel like, man, how are we going to fix something that seems to be so broken in society overall? you're in good company. This feels very big and um, and should speak to a little bit the imperativeness of this work. So we're going to give you some ideas as to how to do this in a school system. First of all, according to Divine and colleagues, we have to be aware of our biases and care about the consequences of them. So as Kent talked about, like learning about those biases is a critical piece. And this is embedded in some of that practitioner awareness, that practitioner identity. So part of knowing our identities as practitioners is really learning about our own biases. And then secondarily, caring about the consequences of those biases. Because frequently our biases don't mean much to us. They're not gonna impact me, but they will impact the people around me negatively. Whether it's one student in a single interaction or a group of students or an entire school of students because my biases are also my teaching partner's biases are also their teaching partner's biases. And then we collectively build those biases into our system without ever talking about them. So what we need to do then is think about, I think it was Cassie, like Cassie is saying, how do you build in that staff development so that your staff can learn about their own biases and the impact of them? We also need to know when our biased responses are more likely. And then we have to have replacement behaviors ready for those times specifically. So I mentioned this earlier, I believe in this session, maybe the last one, but we have something out there in the literature for PBIS called a vulnerable decision point, VDP. Thank you, PBIS, for acronym soup. A vulnerable decision point, or a VDP, is a specific decision that's more vulnerable to the effects of our biases, our internal biases. So when we think about that, there are two main pieces to it. A person's internal state, my own internal state, and then combine that with a specific situation. 
We have a graphic to explain this a little bit. But when we think about that, that piece of like what's happening during that point in time for the adult, that's that internal state. So we start with that. For me, my example frequently is when I'm hungry, I'm going to make a biased decision. That's pretty much how it goes. So when we have that internal state, that piece that we know, like I'm especially vulnerable at this time or during this thing, then we add a given situation to it, which in schools for the sake of PBIS is typically a student behavior. When that interaction between those two things occurs, whether it's disrespect, disruption, something usually subjective, Adult decisions, our decisions are especially vulnerable to our biases and to any defaults that we might hold. This holds true outside of education as well. In any situation, if we're stressed or pressured or need to make a quick decision, any human is more likely to respond in a way that reflects their biases, whether they realize it or not. That's the core of that implicit association test. So if you've taken that and you know you have to respond fairly quickly, that's because if you're responding quickly, if you're responding in the moment, if you feel a little bit of pressure, they know that you're going to lean back on your biases without considering them, without thinking about them. In schools, the research tells us that vulnerable decision points are most likely to occur under three specific circumstances. The first is when the behavior is subjective or difficult to define, things like disrespect or teasing out minor behavior from major behavior. The second is in non-classroom areas where it's unlikely that the student and staff have a pre-existing relationship. The third is in the afternoon when teachers are more tired. So what can we do? We can work with our staff to help them develop something called a neutralizing routine. These all sound really official. You don't have to call them this in, their, in your schools if you don't want to. What we care about is the content here. So what we're looking for is a routine that's quick, that's easy, that's a plan that we must practice as adults that will help mitigate the impact of our biases on our decisions when we experience those VDPs. So when we're more likely to rely on a bias, we need to be sure that we have an alternative behavior, something that we can quickly jump to. There are three easy steps to that neutralizing routine. The first is knowing your hot buttons. So for me, I mentioned being hungry. The second step is to find an alternative. In my example, I can pre-plan by having snacks around. I have some here today. <laughs> but I also need an in-the-moment plan, which might be to take five deep breaths before responding to a behavioral error and then postpone any decisions about consequences for a short time if possible. Finally, the third is making a plan to actually use the routine that we develop. So think about this like skill development for students. Without practice, it's unlikely that this is going to be a skill that we're going to use or use well. And when we're talking through these behaviors and a different response to behavior, I want to be sure to clarify that we're not saying that unsafe behaviors or crisis behaviors should go unchecked in your building. What we're talking about are the low level behaviors that we're typically responding to from a biased perspective that cumulatively add up to a student learning how our system responds to them and then resulting in down the road some of those crisis, some of those unsafe behaviors. Because we've taught those students in many cases that that's what they need to do in order to get what they need from our system. So again, just to reiterate, we're not saying that crisis or unsafe behaviors should go unchecked. We're not saying to take five deep breaths before you address something that's unsafe. We're really trying to get at where the issue of disproportionality begins, which is right at that universal level with how we set up our system with those low level behaviors. So one way to examine those vulnerable decision points and create a plan is by using this neutralizing pathway. So this is a way that you could have your staff or something along these lines document their plan for that neutralizing routine. This could be what they use potentially. In this pathway, we have added some additional questions to ask ourselves when we see a student misbehave. So specifically, we have the misbehavior. We want to ask, is this a vulnerable decision point? Is it the behavior a cultural mismatch? 
or is it a behavioral error? And then as adults, we might be programmed to assume that the behavior was due to being impulsive or being angry. However, in a responsive system, we must consider the possibility that the behavior is not wrong, but is actually a mismatch between the student's home culture and the classroom culture. That does not mean that the classroom culture is right. I want you to not think that, but what it does mean is that how we're setting up the system could potentially not be a match for how the student has lived their life to this point. So at the beginning of the neutralizing pathway, we add our two questions. Is this a VDP? Is this a behavioral error? Or is it a cultural mismatch? If we're not sure of the answers, pausing and using a diffusing statement is going to give us time to reflect and examine the situation. Our actions are going to be determined by how we answer those questions. So if we determine that the behavior is cultural, we use specific positive feedback to affirm that cultural behavior known as validating and affirming from Dr. Shiraki Holly's work. And then we consider whether we teach an alternative behavior to increase the student's cultural capital so we build and bridge to the system as it is, or we consider making room in our system for the cultural behavior. Many behaviors that our students have learned from their families or their communities are not wrong, but they are also not always welcomed or valued in our school settings. One example of this is the use of overlap in conversation. So while some families and some cultures place a high value on being able to get in where you fit in conversationally, like you make space for yourself, you don't wait with your hand raised. This is often seen in our school systems as interrupting, and it's often given a negative connotation in our settings. In reality, overlap can be a valuable skill for all students to learn and to learn how and when it's the best form of communication. But that means we have to make room for it in our schools. That means we have to think through how we can validate and how we can support that behavior and how we can let students know when that's the best choice. So potentially as an adult, I might be in a situation where if I don't speak up for myself without raising my hand or waiting for a pause, I won't have my needs met. It's important to teach students that they'll be in situations like that. And at times this is going to be what they need to do. Just blanketly telling them not to interrupt because interrupting is negative, isn't preparing our kids for the world that they're going to be out in. So what do the most vulnerable decision states look like? You've heard me mention mine, some that are common in schools. Here are a few more that show up in some research. So specifically fatigue, the effects of hunger, and decreases in willpower later in the day. Those are the ones that show up in the, resources, in the research. VDPs can be identified in any number of ways. So I've told you uh, like my personal story about mine. It's really obvious that it's hunger and hopefully you'll never have to experience that with me. But in order to examine your system, for patterns of VDPs across staff, you'll want to consider looking at aggregated data from your office discipline referrals, your suspension decisions, and then look for patterns in that decision-making. Your team can also look to national school or district data to find common VDPs and then target those specifically for more support. So as an example, I'm gonna run really quickly through some national Swiss data. This is a little bit older, 11, 12. I'm gonna pretend it's not 2021 and I have no idea how fast time is flying. But um, this data includes, this data set includes over 3 million office referrals, comes from over 6,000 schools and 47 states. So I'm gonna run through this and then we will get back to what it could look like. Here you see that the subjective behaviors of defiance and disrespect are the most common problem behaviors identified. Additionally, you can see that while white students are earning almost an equal amount of minors versus majors for those behaviors, black students are receiving almost double the amount of major referrals for minor re versus minor referrals. So the ambiguity of defining of defiance and disrespect, along with the challenge of determining whether each is a major or a minor breeds that disproportionate representation. 
Additionally, you can see here that the most common locations for behavior referrals are the classroom, hallway, and playground. Of the non-classroom settings, so hallway and playground, the hallway is the setting where staff are least likely to have a pre-existing relationship with the students they're giving office referrals to. So what you can see here is that in this data sample, black students are, over, are more represented than white students in that specific setting. Here you can see that over the course of the day, black students are receiving more referrals in the afternoon than their white peers. So what does all of this mean? It means that we see the same evidence of ambiguity, the same evidence of VDPs as the research tells us exist. So in places where there's ambiguity in behavior definition, with the second most likely setting being one where staff likely do not have a relationship with students, and then evidence of inequities in the data in the afternoon. So the national data reinforces that ambiguity, a lack of contact and fatigue are all factors in disproportionate representation and discipline data. So how can your teams work on this? One way is to refer to the PBIS Cultural Responsiveness Field Guide that was published by the National Center on PBIS. This is something that um, Kent and I have worked on with a team of people. Ruthie has also contributed and it has been, it's hopefully an ongoing living document is what we intend it to be. So the guide will walk through TFI line items pertaining to tier one implementation and offer a culturally responsive elaboration for each line item along with specific examples of what that might look like in practice. The examples for behavior definitions prompt teams to open the doors of communication up with staff, students, and families, and the community to ensure that behavior expectations are working for and representing all stakeholders. And remember what we've been talking about all morning, subjectivity in behavior definitions is disproportionality's best friend. You have to look out for that. When we think about those problem behavior definitions, specifically from the field guide, this page refers to that line item on the TFI. The examples here encourage, shocker, engaging stakeholders in creating or modifying those, those definitions. So just as we talked about earlier with, I think it might've been Laura, but I'm terrible with names, getting that stakeholder voice into those definitions and into that delineation of minor versus major is critical. Um, one quick thing before I hand this back over to Kent, we have to move away from this unidimensional view of bias. So this idea that racial bias equals disproportionate discipline. That's really not how things play out. What we see more commonly is that there's some racial bias that we're either aware or unaware of, coupled with a specific situation. So if you think back to the VDP slide, and then that's where disproportionate discipline is resulting. So that's where we want to keep your mind at today. And I'm going to hand this back over to Kent so that he can close out our presentation. Oops. Thank you, Mulaney. And all right. So what we have left is to really address some of the common questions and give you something to work with um, when people challenge this notion of um, implicit bias and the role identity plays. I'm going to fly through one example of what that um, neutralization routine looks like, and that will bring us to the end, hopefully with enough time for a little bit of question and answer and for you to get your code, your CEU code. So. Over the course of the last probably eight or nine years, um, as the field guide was being piloted in, in some districts, as we were getting feedback in districts, as some of the people from the National Center were doing this work, um, as we were training and supporting schools in Wisconsin, we started seeing some common questions coming up again and again as we started kind of working on the systems stuff. So we do want to thank um, dissenters over the last few years that had the courage to raise some of these questions and raise these points that other people may be thinking. Um, so the first question, well, okay, but isn't 
the racial mismatch or the racial disproportionality in the data really more all about poverty. And I think Dr. Muhammad mentioned this a little bit in his keynote yesterday. The truth is, while poverty plays a little bit of a role, racial disproportionality remains when we control for that poverty. So in a lot of these studies, what you end up seeing is um, patterns of discipline contact or, or discipline disproportionality is studied as isolated within um, districts where there's comparable SES. And when you start controlling for that SES, race is the bigger predictor that these patterns will play out. These patterns are gonna be seen. Second question, aren't black boys just more violent? No, not at all. There's no evidence of a different base rate of behavior for any subgroup. In fact, um, it's critical to note that the role of behavior, how that plays out in referral is not in terms of the um, significance of behavior, but the significance of consequence, which makes it look like the behavior infraction was more severe. In other words, what you started seeing, especially some of the early studies by um, Russ Skiba, by Dan Lawson, were that not only were um, students of color, particularly black students, getting referral for subjective behaviors that were minor, but the consequences that they were receiving were more significant. So it might be um, a minor referral or a minor disciplinary contact or a minor reteaching for something like blurting out, but it tended to result in a more significant consequence like exclusion from the classroom in school suspension, something like that. So there is no difference in base rate of behavior for any of the groups in any of the studies that looked at this. Saying that all teachers are racist. No, absolutely not. The research that's been done, and we've talked about this, indicates that disproportionality comes from um, unconscious bias or implicit bias, those things that we're not even aware of, right? When we're, when we're required to make those snap judgments, that's where we get into this. And generally because they're unconscious, we haven't attended to them, we haven't paid attention to them, which is why we want to. And that brings us to that conversation about um, the multi-step neutralization routines. So what do we do when we know that our own identity and our own implicit biases are kicking in or when we're faced with those vulnerable decision points that Melanie talked about? Experts in this work, like Kent McIntosh and others, have recommended the use of something called a neutralization or a neutralizing routine. So when we're faced with that behavior, we're faced with that vulnerable decision point, we train ourselves to consider two things. First, is it a vulnerable decision point? The situation, the state that I'm in, right? That particularly annoying behavior for me, and I'm hungry, or and I'm tired right? If it's that vulnerable decision point, then I need to figure out what to do about it, create that alternative response. So now I'll give you my example in just a second. So for those of you that are familiar with functional behavioral assessment, this should look pretty familiar, right? We're talking about the setting events, we're talking about student behavior and consequence the concepts within an FBA, but what we're doing is taking those and applying them to ourselves when implicit biases begin to play a role. So for the sake of illustration, consider the following. You have a student that you don't particularly have a positive relationship with or you don't know well. You're also tired and you're also hungry. During that time, the student begins to complain loudly about some aspect of the assignment or the demand placed on them in the classroom. You note that the behavior, and you start beginning, you're asking yourself, is this one of those VDP things that Mulaney was talking about? You realize that it is because you've had time to think about them. So instead of relying on your standard response, which in the past may have been sending the student to the office for the minor infraction, and the student gets that escape or gets to leave the class, you give yourself an alternate response. Instead of jumping into, you're going to the office that was disrespectful, you're going to do something, an alternate response that says something like, see me after class. And again, we're not talking about when we're seeing that violent 
stuff, we're talking about these low intensity things where the majority of these disciplinary contacts come into play. So in this alternate response, you're still putting the student and their behavior on cue, right? You're saying, hey, that thing that you did, we're gonna talk about. And then it gives you time to stop and think and consider what was going on and create that better response, um, especially instead of responding in a way that is going to lead to exclusion or reinforcement of undesired behaviors. So what makes for a good neutralization routine? It's brief, so you can identify it if I'm hungry, if I'm tired, if I'm stressed. It guides the different response. It uses something like an if-then statement. If I'm hungry and I see this behavior, I will blank. It has clear steps. So I will give myself time to think before reacting. So the whole neutralization routine looks something like, if I'm tired when the disruption occurs, I will give myself time to think before I take any action. I will tell the student to see me later. The fourth step is it's doable, right? You've got clear steps, it's easy to do, it's easy to implement, and it's easy to monitor and see if you did. So those alternate responses, a delay, see me after class. It kind of recognizes the role of implicit bias and it recognizes when implicit bias comes to life when we make that, when we're required to make that snap judgment, right? Alternate responses break that cycle. That break in action also allows us to consider the impact of our actions, especially in, term, in terms of the impact on what we wanna see happen, right? Those disciplinary responses, sending the student out of the classroom, sending the student out of the, down to the office, doesn't actually teach a replacement skill. It doesn't build behavioral fluency. All those exclusionary practices do is create a break in the in the cycle, right? And we know that our responses to behavior error should result in more practice and helping students generalize the skill, right? So we wanna make sure that our approach, our reaction, our response isn't counterproductive to what we're trying to do. And then lastly, by using an alternate response, it allows us to build relationships with the students to help understand their frame of reference or gather more information when it's needed. Examples of neutralizing routines. You can ask yourself if this is a VDP, stopping to question, am I acting in line with my values? Or something like, if it's something like defiance, I'm keeping the student in class and we'll talk about it rather than using exclusion. If I'm tired, I'm going to delay my reaction until I can think more clearly. So see me after class, and it allows you to think whether or not you're acting in line with your values or to take two breaths, right? You kind of get the idea, right? If we can identify it's a vulnerable decision point, what are we going to do about it in a way that not only helps build a relationship with the student, but also breaks that impact of implicit bias? It's also ideal for you to think about creating several of these identifying several of your vulnerable decision points, identifying several neutralizing routines that you can keep in your back pocket. So when you see it, you have that script that you can respond to, right? The more that you use something, the more habitual it becomes. So we wanna think about those neutralizing routines for staff, right? So anybody that has contact with students in our school who may be interacting with them in a way to reteach behavior or to address behavior error, we can teach this too. We can, you know, we can embed this in our professional development models to help all of our staff build these skills. But we also can think about doing this for administrators as well. Before having to address a situation, administrators need to kind of think through this process too, or as Susan Barrett put it in one in, um, in some of her work, when administrators are faced with handling a problem, behavior problem, first thing that they need to do is tell themselves to not just do something, but to stand there. To make sure that they are ready to interact with the student around the behavior and that they're capable of acting in line with the values that they hold, that they're able to gather information 
so it's not just sort of based on this first and usually sort of isolated piece of information. They're also able to assess student-teacher relationships. The second thing, they're also able to use that agreed upon instructional response that's going to help build or teach the missing skill, will aid in skill generalization, and ultimately will help connect the student to the school and to the other staff, rather than sending the message that behavior is so bad, you don't belong here. You can plug restorative practices in as a part of this, right? And when we talk about restoring that relationship between the student, the staff, the school, or other students involved, this is part of what those conversations can look like. But ultimately, what we're wanting is we think about these neutralization routines. When we stop to act and we stop to think, is considering this concept of VAB, of validation, affirmation, building, and bridging. And this is something that Dr. Shiraki Holly kind of created a number of years ago and has embedded in all of his culturally responsive practices work. When we're considering behavior in the educational environment, what we need to do is make sure that we are considering the behavior that we're seeing in the educational context, that we're not making assumptions, that our own biases aren't kicking in. I know this, everyone should know this. I know how to behave, everyone should know how to behave. We need to make sure that our strategies that we leverage validate and affirm the student of recognizing who they are, what they're bringing to the table, their prior knowledge, their prior learning, and identify where there may be gaps in that instruction for the educational setting. And when we see those gaps between what students know and what we're expected, we're going to teach, we're going to help practice, we're going to acknowledge, we're going to help the students generalize those skills. If you think about it, schools are artificial environments, right? I don't know of a single home where a student is required to learn how to move in the hall with three or 400 other people or required to line up in order to get their meal, right? Or have to interact with 75 other adults on a given day. There are going to be skill gaps. And our job is to make sure that we understand where the students start from and that we teach, we build the connections, and we help the students generalize skills when we're expecting behaviors that are different, not assuming that everyone should know because it, we do. The professional development and your universal team especially can take this kind of approach, right? You do a data review. You notice that you're seeing a lot of the referrals for subjective behaviors that Mulaney shared, right? As a leadership team, once you talk about the things that we're wanting to teach the students through our behavior lesson plans, the other part of this is what we're gonna do with our staff to help them start thinking about VDPs, neutralization routines, and then make sure that we're monitoring for ongoing support. The last thing um, before we kind of give you the code and take care of any questions, somebody had mentioned this earlier, is the Harvard Implicit Associations test. And this is a really good, simple way for you to sort of look for your own implicit biases that may hide around a number of different associations. If you go to the website, you create your account, you can examine your own biases related to race, to gender, disability, body style. Uh, I wanna say there's like 23 different areas. The activity is, is informative and it's powerful. However, my caution for you is that you use this for yourself first, so you understand what it looks like, the, res the reports that you get and how you can use it. But then if you're gonna use it with other people, make sure you put it into context. The goal is not to have people identify their bias and then be able to say, ooh, bad Kent, you have a bias. That's not the point. The point of this is for us to be able to see our blind spot and then be able to think about what we're going to do about it because we all have them. So with that, um, I think we are coming pretty close to the end of this. Um, Melanie, Ruthie, anything that you want to add? Any questions or comments before I put the code up on the screen? There are some great questions and comments in the chat. We've been kind of working through them as you've been talking. So 
One was about um, whether to document those behaviors that may be a cultural mismatch. Like, do we put, do we collect an office referral on those? Um, my answers in the chat, I said, absolutely. The data nerd in me thinks that if those are not documented, you will never be able to see the patterns that exist in your system and the inequities in your system. So I said, yes. And then the other um, conversation that came up in the chat just recently was, thinking about behavior documentation is less about documenting the behavior. It's not a tally mark and more about documenting the interaction that a staff yes. had with a student around the behavior. And that can help really address some of the issues that we see in schools where people want to document a minor, but they don't want to do the reteaching that really needs to go along with the documentation of that minor behavior. So yeah. if you reframe yeah. that a little bit, that yeah. can help. And the thing I wanted to add to that is I really appreciate how during the session you talk a lot about the identity awareness, um, uh, the importance of that. And I think that and you also really reiterated across the, the, the two sessions that you all have led the importance of including multiple and diverse stakeholders at every point of the process, because what that does is it helps all school members begin to understand more about the different nuance, cultural nuances that exists and people begin to understand more of the difference between the behavior that's more culturally nuanced uh, rather than simply seeing it as a misbehavior. And I think that changes how the interactions occur between adults and students uh, uh, over time. Absolutely. And I think I'm sure Kent said this, I was probably chatting while he said it, but I, it's, I think it's really critical to note too that I truly believe in my heart, I think the three of us especially believe that educators go into education to help students. Mm -hmm. Like they, no one's going into this with malicious intent. We don't think that that's happening at all. No. It's more about the fact that we're all going into this with these really great intentions and we're blind as human beings are, we're blind to some of the things that impact our decision-making on a daily basis that help produce these outcomes for students, these negative outcomes. So that's really where the conversation lies. And if you're concerned about talking through this with your staff or nervous about some of the feelings that might come up, you're right to be concerned and nervous. <laughs> it can get a little bit messy, but it's not going to get better until we make it messy. And if so, you want to reach out and practice with us, we're happy to do that too. Absolutely. We have screwed up so many times. <laughs> it is almost, yes. and we'll we've continue almost experienced to, right? all of them. Yes. As humans, yes. we'll continue to, absolutely. Um, I want to pause and make sure before we close out, are there any other thoughts? Yes. Yes, Beth. Uh, Self-awareness yeah. work is, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think, again, uh, there was a, a comment made earlier in the chat around the implications for pre-service education, but there's also an implication for ongoing professional learning yeah. when we're in service. And so those are two connecting we can't necessarily influence. We can, and we're working on it. But if you're in a building in a, in a district, you can't necessarily, you're not necessarily dictating what colleges do. So what we have to think about is what is a professional development plan uh, that's going to be ongoing for our, our staff to support this work. And these are really good strategies that you all have provided. So it was a great session. I completely agree. Thank you, my lady, Thank you. for another amazing and thought-provoking session. And more importantly, all the uh, application uh, at things that people can go back and actually do. I think that's so important. I also want to thank all of you for participating in this session, for your amazing engagement and your questions uh, and the thoughts that you shared. Uh, please make sure you're recording the code for the ending of this session and your, uh, your sketch application. We're gonna leave it up uh, for a few minutes and we encourage you to make sure that you, if you have time to join the live informational booths from 11.45 to 12.05, you can enter the booths tab on the navigation pane. And then please come back and make sure that you don't miss our closing keynote with Dr. Nicole Hollins Sim, which is gonna start promptly at 12.15. You can click on the general sessions icon on the navigation pane to access the closing keynote session. And once again, those codes will be there uh, at the beginning of the session. So make sure you get there as early as possible so that you can get them. Thank you and you all have a great rest of this, uh, the conference and day. Thank you for coming.